guys, welcome back to the channel Daughter of Increase. My name is Nate Denise. For those of you who are new to the channel or who just happen to stumble across this video, it's I post new videos every Tuesday and Thursday all about my faith, God, Christ, and expanding the kingdom of God. So I am back to dive back into Ephesians. Um, we left off with chapters 5 and 6, and I didn't get able, I wasn't able to actually do live sessions for those because I was dealing with my grandmother's funeral and whatnot so I am just going to be recording these for YouTube and then posting them up obviously onto YouTube and in the Facebook group so yeah we'll get back into live sessions um, in March for the Jonah Bible study but I wanted to definitely just catch up and finish up with chapters 5 and 6 so I'm gonna be recording chapter 5 now for you guys and then doing chapter 6 probably the day after or two days after we'll see but, um, yeah, so the Bible that I'm using for those of you who are new to these Bible study sessions is the single column journaling Bible and the ESV from Crossway. This is going to be the last time for the book of Ephesians that I'm going to be using this translation for a while because I'm going to switch over to using my New King James just because I do personally prefer the New King James and that's how I study um, with that translation. But I do enjoy using the ESV. Um, because it is an easier translation to understand but that's the one that I'm using right now I have my post-it note here I have some extra paper in case I need it for kind of how like we did this one I just um, glued this in but it was just an extra piece of paper in case I need space which I just might need space I do have the Ephesians chapter 5 notes here if you guys don't have the notes they are available for ten dollars on my blog I think it's about 30 pages if I can if I can remember correctly I believe it's 30 pages long um, worth of notes so you guys can check the blog for that link is down below I have my pencil so I'm gonna be using the micron 01.25 millimeter uh, pen which is archival ink and then I just have this 0.7 oil gel pen to write on the paper with then I have all of my like highlighting utensils that I use so I use Crayola Super Tips to do some highlighting. I love these mild liners from Zebra. I use the Crayola Twistable Colored Pencils and also some Sharpie Smear God highlighters. So, we're going to dive into this. I'm going to just move some stuff around quickly. I am a little cold and I am a little bit sick. I am not feeling the best, but I don't want to keep holding out on um, getting this study done. So bear with me if I pause or have to sneeze or I cough or anything like that. Um, so quickly, I am going to do a quick prayer. And I, when I say quick, I mean it's going to be a quick, simple prayer. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to dive into the study so that I can edit it and upload it. Um, hopefully today, if not tomorrow. Um, and when I say today, I mean today is Wednesday. I was supposed to upload a video Tuesday. That video is still not edited and then I need to upload this today. Um, right now it is 9.28 as I am recording this. So hopefully I can be done within an hour. I can edit it and upload it before the evening. But um, yeah, so uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for just waking us up and allowing us to breathe the fresh breath that you have given us, Father God. I am asking that you... Uh, come into this study, Father God, that we may be able to take something from the study and apply it to our lives and that we may be able to know you more and understand you more and walk worthy of the calling and to walk as we are, to walk as your children. Um, I am asking that you touch the hearts of those listening and to those who are taking in this study, Father God. Amen. So yeah, um, short, sweet almost confusing but we're gonna dive right into this study hopefully you guys can see um i don't want to zoom in too close let's get the bookmark out of the way but we are on chapter five and chapter five i personally entitled life in the spirit because that's basically what it's talking about how to walk um in love and then you know the whole husband and wife situation so i titled it life in the spirit and um, we're going to dive in. Of course, for those of you who are new to the way that I do Bible studies, how I do this is I read paragraph by paragraph or section by section. It depends on how you prefer. But when I'm doing these live sessions or recorded sessions, I read paragraph by paragraph. And the first thing that I do is read the paragraph completely through without any markings, without anything. 
The second time I go through and I circle words that I want to define, and these can be words that I do know and words that I don't know. I do this because I want to define them in their original language, and because we are in the book of Ephesians and Ephesians is in the New Testament, I know that the New Testament is written in Greek, so I will look up the definition in Greek because a lot of the times, the terms that we believe that they are, or rather the definition that we give words are not the same definitions that they were giving back in the day. So, um, especially during the time the Bible was written. So that's why I prefer to look up the actual Greek definitions for these words. Um, once I have my definitions done, I then go in and I underline parts of verses or anything, phrases that stick out to me and make my notes. And um, once I make my notes, I box them out and then I add color because, I mean... Color just makes everything pretty. I'm trying to get this so you can see. So color just makes everything like absolutely prettier. And um, I want to show you guys a terrible pen to use. So I used a pen and it was a Bic. I think it was a Bic. I'm not sure. I think this was a Bic pen that I was using. But um, it did some terrible, terrible like bleeding. It's terrible. So, um, I'm just going to stick with my microns from now on. I do have a blue ink one, but because I've been using black. Actually, you know what? We're going to use blue today. So, this is my black one, but I'm going to switch to blue. Um, is this my blue one? Yes. So, I'm going to use blue today to see how I like it. So, we are going to start. Hopefully, you guys can see this. Let me fix the camera a bit. I want you guys to be able to see this as best as possible. Let's get this to focus. Alright. Sorry. Alright, hopefully this is good for you guys. Alright, so. Chapter 5 of, of Ephesians, Walk in Love is what it's titled. And I'm just going to dive in reading without making any marking. So. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness, covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Verse 4. Let there be no filthiness nor foolishness, I'm sorry, let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to discern what is pleasing to the lord verse 11 take no part in the unfruitful unfruitful works of darkness but instead expose them for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret but when anything is exposed by the light it becomes visible for every for anything that becomes visible is light therefore it says awake o sleeper and arise from the dead and christ will shine on you so again, I just read verses 1 through 14. So now that I have that done, I am now going to go in and circle words that I want to defy. First one is going to be imitators. The next one is going to be beloved. Sorry, I'm just trying to get this right. So beloved. The next word is going to be covetousness, which is here in verse 3. In verse 6, we have empty. In verse 8, we have darkness. And also light. Verse 10, we have discern. And I believe I have one more or two more words. Let's see. Yes, one more word. In verse 11, we have expose. So, because I don't want this to be like a super, super long recording, I already went ahead and uh, wrote out the definitions. So, all that I have to do is like just color them with the markers. But um, I am going to run through the definitions with you guys. 
So imitators, here is the Greek word, and the meaning is follower. Beloved, it's dear, favorite, or esteemed. Covetousness is greedy desire to have more. Empty is vain, devoid of truth. And again, I do have the Greek words already written. Let's get this to focus for you guys. Discern. Metaphorically, I mean, sorry, darkness is metaf metaphorically meaning spiritually, morally, or intellectually blind, ignorant, rebellious, or disobedient. Light means imbued with saving wisdom, one in who wisdom and spiritual purity shines forth and who imparts the same to others. Discern is to test, prove, examine, or scrutinize. And the last word is going to be expose which is reprove rebuke by conviction conviction bring to light so i wrote all of that out here so all that i'm going to do now is just add color because we like color So I hope you guys are all doing good. Um, this weather is like really ridiculous. I'm over it. I'm over snow. I'm over just everything with this weather. Um, but yeah, I will be starting the Jonah study. In um, March. And I already have the notes available for that. So if you do want the notes for Jonah... Um, they are a link down below. It's a full printable that you can print out, but you do have to pay for it. Um, and if you guys don't know why I started charging, it is because it is a lot of time, a lot of work, and a lot of people were taking it for granted when I was doing this for free. So after much consulting with the Holy Spirit, um, with the Holy Spirit, with God, and um, things of that nature, I decided just to charge a small fee. Um, just so that I know people are taking this serious, I do these notes because I enjoy doing them. Um, I enjoy Bible study, but it is a lot of work because I have to do double the amount of work um, because I'm teaching it to you guys. So, you know, hopefully that works with you guys. But, alright, so we have colors down. Let's move on to our notes now. So, it says, therefore, be imitators as beloved children that first burst. So, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, right? So, basically, it's saying that we need to imitate God and not the world. Um, we need to strive to be more like him, and we need to make God our example. And um, the reason why he is comparing it to children is because children na naturally imitate their parents. They watch what their parents do, and they naturally do whatever their parents do because it's what they see as an example every day. So, therefore, um, the word therefore here is kind of like a building block. So, it builds on top of and depends on the other points that Paul mentioned in the previous chapter, which was chapter 4. So, if you haven't seen that study, definitely go back and um study chapter four with us or you can study it on your own but um the whole point of therefore is to be a building block to build on top of and depend on what he already mentioned so the first thing i'm going to do here which i should have did was i'm going to box therefore and i'm going to write over here a building block on top of and depending on points in chapter 4 because a lot of the times um, when Paul writes his letters there's always a therefore um, mentioned and a lot of the time people bypass that and don't 
think to really understand it but um, I think it's crucial to understand that even though this is a separate chapter in a sense and it is a different section it does depend on everything he mentioned in chapters one through four so I think that point of therefore is important and again back to the um, be imitators of God as beloved children children naturally imitate their parents and as children of God we should naturally imitate him and strive to be like him so that's all that I'm gonna write children let's get my arm in here some way again i'm sorry about this you guys i have to get better set up for my camera but children naturally imitate their parents As such, we should imitate him. Um, so there we go. I do have cross references, but let me just pull those up. I'm not going to. Sorry, just turn my phone on silent. <laughs> I am not going to always read them out loud, but a few of them I will read. Um, if you want all of the cross references, they are in the notes. Um, so just bear with me a second. So on um, Matthew's five and forty eight. Um, it says, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. So um, this is just a reminder that God is our father. And therefore, him being our father tells us that we are his children. We are his sons and daughters. And as such, we need to imitate him. And um, the next one, if I can pull that up, is going to be 1 Peter 1, 14 to 16. So actually, let me write these out first. So Matthew... 548 and then 1st Peter 1 14 to 16 Okay, and that reads as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy and you also be holy in all your contact conduct sorry because it is written be holy for i am holy so in this it is calling us children it's telling us to be obedient as children um and, to conf and not to conform ourselves to the former lust so basically if we're not going to conform ourselves to the former lust we need to conform ourselves to the ways of god therefore we need to imitate him because we are his children basically that's all it's saying is that um as his children and because we are his children we need to look at him and imitate the things that he is doing So now I'm just going to add some color. I will say that doing this is much better when you have like black underlining underneath instead of blue. But this works. But I will say use black ink. It just, I don't know, black ink just looks much more better than the blue ink to me. But we're still going to rock with it. Um, moving on, it says, walk in love in verse 2. So, therefore, it, that means to live in love for others, to display self-giving love. And the cross-reference I have for that is going to be 1 Thessalonians 4 and 9. Okay. Then it says, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So, acting in love is pleasing to the Father. That, you know, that's always going to be something that is pleasing to Him. So, we need to remember that um, we need to act in love and to live in love which means to walk in love if that makes sense moving on i'm going to skip ahead to verse five um so it says everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous that is an idolater has no inheritance in the kingdom of christ and god Okay, so that means those who partake in darkness have no in inheritance. Only those who walk in the light can obtain it. So, I'm going to underline this. Okay. 
you know what I'm gonna go back here to verse 2 where it says walk in love and um, I'm going to write display self-giving love and when I say self-giving I mean giving of yourself I just wanted to go back and write that. Okay. So going back to verse 5. Um, those who partake. Let me just get this camera to focus. Those who partake in darkness have no inheritance. Okay. And the cross references for that is going to be First Corinthians six nine. Um, sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 and 10 and then Colossians 3 and 5. Then in 6 it says, let no one deceive you with empty words. So only truth needs to come out of your mouth. Nothing that is um, void or vain. And um, pretty much is what it's saying. I mean, you know, that let no one deceive you with empty words. So anything that someone says, if they are not um, true, if it's not truth, then you need not listen to it. And though that is hard to do at times, I mean, the enemy definitely likes to um, spew empty words at us all the time. You know, you're not worth it. You're not pretty enough. You don't work hard enough. But the truth is, we are worth. We are worth it. Um, we do work hard enough. We do uh, mean much. We are worthy of much. And that's because the Father, who is God, tells us that in His Word. So anything that opposes His Word, that is opposite of His Word, is the void of truth. So therefore, we are technically not supposed to be listening to those things. We are not supposed to let those things deceive us. But being the humans that we are, and being vulnerable, and um, simply weak-minded, we tend to allow the enemy to use his empty words to deceive us so this is just a reminder to just not to listen to the words of the enemy not to listen to anybody who speaks um false or is the void of truth hopefully that makes sense so i'm actually going to underline this don't allow anything but truth move you so anything the enemy says should not move us but obviously it does so this is just a good reminder specifically to me honestly okay so moving on to verse 8 it says for at one time you were in darkness or you were darkness rather for at one time you were darkness but now you are light in the lord so for at one time you were darkness so before we were saved we conducted ourselves in a life of wickedness um this is just telling us to remember where we came from and i think this is a, is essential because a lot of the times especially in churches um when people get these titles ministers evangelist uh prophet deacon you know pastor bishop they tend to become judgmental and um you know you're judging people that are where you once were and you tend to forget where you came from. You tend to forget that you weren't always this holy, sanctified bishop, this holy, sanctified pastor. There was a time you was out there having sex before marriage. There was a time you was out there drinking. There was a time you was out there smoking. There was a time you was out there saying things out of your mouth that probably should have not been said. There, were a t there was a time before you knew who God was, before you were saved, that you was out there being a hot mess, just like other people are being a hot mess now. And um, I think we just tend to forget that because we found jesus um we we like to wipe clean the slate and try not to remember those things and though god doesn't remember those things um we personally need to remember that we were once there and because we see people that are there we need not judge them but we need to be of help to them so for at one time you were in darkness 
I'm going to say before saved. I'm going to start writing some more now, but before saved. Once lived. In wickedness. Right, and then it says, but now you are light in the Lord. So this means that we now have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that makes us, um, that makes a source of light for others. So um, because we now have the Holy Spirit, we are in the presence of God. We, we not, not in the presence of God, but we have the ability to have 24-7 access to God. But in that, we also have... A source in us to become a light to other people some people will never make it to the church and I've heard this so many times that some people will never make it to the church but um, just meeting you as a Christian could help them change their lives to um, hand their lives over to Christ so though we were once in a time of darkness and we were once living in sin and wickedness now that we have the holy spirit and dwelling in us we can now be a source of light to help others to come out of that darkness we can help pull people out of darkness which reminds me of when um jesus told peter that he was going to now make change his profession in a, in a sense and now make him a fisher of men instead of just a fisherman because um he wanted to change what he was now catching peter used to catch fish in the sea now Jesus wanted him to catch men. He wanted to catch souls. He wanted him to save souls and bring souls to him, if that makes sense. So, um, let me just make the mark here. I'm going to say with indwelling. Holy Spirit. Now can be a source of light. Hopefully you guys can hear me. So the part where it says, but now you are light in the world. I'm sorry, light in the Lord. I said with the indwelling Holy Spirit, now you can be a source of light. And just so you guys know, a lot of the times my notes are not going to be all these theological sound, biblically, you know, technological terms in um things a lot of the time they're just thoughts that i have and i think that's something that i want you guys to understand is that when you're doing these notes they don't have to be all sound and theological and correct they're just your thoughts they are just what you think about when you um read the bible they're what you're studying when you read the bible um a lot of the times i write down my initial thoughts of a verse and then i go in to study it be it with a study bible with um you know, study helps that I find online resources, the books that I have. So a lot of the times they're not going to be some profound, you know, revelation. They're just my thoughts. <laughs> and in this case, that's pretty much what verse 8 is. It's basically my thoughts. So I just want to keep let you guys know that because a lot of the times, I'm sure a lot of you think um, my notes are like completely sound. But, you know, a lot of the times they're just simple things that I think of. And um, I do, you know, obviously research it before I write down my thoughts permanently in my bible but that's pretty much how i look at journaling um when you're doing the bible journaling it's basically you just journaling your thoughts and your 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 findings and your revelations from god pretty much um then it says walk as children of light so we are to expose sin and illuminate the path to jesus for um others and when i say expose sin i don't mean <laughs> in a rude way making the person feel bad you are to expose sin in a very um what is the right word to say i don't know the right word to say but when you expose sin you're not exposing sin to humiliate the person you're just exposing the sin so that they are made aware of their sin so that they now can understand that they're walking or living in sin and that they can now make the correct decision to no longer be in sin um you know there's never been a time that i think that god 
or Christ rather has exposed my sin to humiliate me. And um, it may feel like he humiliated me because of my own personal feelings, but he has never intentionally done it to humiliate me. It's always been to expose the sin so that I am made aware of the sin so that I can now change my mind or change my actions to now not live in that sin anymore. And I think a lot of people don't understand that just because you're holy sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, um, you don't have the right to humiliate someone, especially if you call it exposing your sin. Um, a lot of people, I, I know a lot of pastors um, who will expose someone's sin thinking that they're doing it um, for their benefit, but they're really doing it to make themselves look good. When you expose a, the sin of a person, it is not to make yourself look good. It is not to make yourself feel good. And it's not to make the other person feel bad. You are doing it out of love. So that they understand what they're doing is wrong and so that they can see that there is um, the way of sin and the way of God. So I think a lot of people need to really, really understand that. And I think I have a cross reference. Let me, let me just um, look for you guys real quick. Yeah, so 1 Thessalonians 5 and 5 says, you, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So being that we are not of darkness, that we are not of night, and that we are of light, um, we need to be that light. We need to illuminate the path to Christ um, and also help expose sin, but not in a way of humiliating people. We need to do it with love and in love. Um, so... I hope that just made sense. I feel like I'm talking in tangents, but hopefully you guys understood that. <laughs> so where do I want to write that? I'm probably going to have to grab um, this over here and start jotting some notes here. So this is still verse 8 where it says, walk as children of light. I'm going to say... Expose sin to glorify God. And illuminate the path to Christ. And again, the cross reference is 1 Thessalonians 5 and 5. Moving on to verse 10, it says, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Um, so all that I'm going to say for that is, um, let me actually underline that first. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. The only thing that I have for that is that um, you can only do this by having a relationship with him and studying and praying. Um, you can't discern anything of the Lord if you don't know who he is and if you don't spend time with him. And to do that, you need to pray to him. You need to converse with him. You need to study his word. You need to read his word. Um, and there is a difference between studying the Bible and reading the Bible. And I'm going to do a whole video on that. But um, I fully believe that you should do both. You should be reading the Bible and studying the Bible um, to really know what pleases him and to be able to discern the things of him. So, I'm going to write that on this paper because I'm not going to just stick it anywhere. So verse 10. Can only do this by having a relationship. with him okay moving on to verse 11 it says take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness whoops then it says but instead expose them so take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness basically it's saying don't engage in darkness or sinful acts with people that is not what we as children of the light should do um and i know for me personally that was a very hard thing to do especially in college um 
I knew who I knew that I was a child of God. I knew that certain things I should not have done. I should not have been clubbing the way I was clubbing. I should have not worn certain things. I should have not been drinking. I should have not been smoking. I should have not been um cursing and having sex and all of that in college. But um unfortunately when we're around people who are not of the light, if you will, um if we're not around other Christians, if we're not around other people who follow and walk the way that we do we tend to do the things that are around us and conform and unfortunately I did conform to the world around me especially in my college days now I did have a relationship with a guy um who was actually Christian and I mean he was an amazing young man um he was a virgin he was saving himself till marriage he was every he was literally the epitome (laughs) of what God um really wants a man to be in college like in his freshman year I was a junior sophomore junior at the time because I had transfer schools but he was a true man of God and um though I spent a lot of my time with him and um we had a good relationship I found that I would push certain things on him that he didn't want um and not in like a crazy type of way um but um I I started noticing things about myself when I was with him that wasn't good for me and um you know it was hard understanding that as a child of God I was living the way I was living and as a child of God he was living the correct way now I'm not I'm not gonna say he didn't have fun obviously he had fun he was in college but he wasn't having the type of crazy um worldly fun that I was having so um I know for a fact that it's definitely hard when it says take no part in unfruitful works of darkness because in college you have freedom you got you get to do what you want. You have no one telling you what not to do and what to do. And um, especially having been used to certain things in my high school days, um, it pretty much was normal to me, unfortunately. And because I wasn't going to church as I was supposed to be going to church, um, I just started to conform to the world. So personally for me, that is a strong reminder. And I wish that I would have um, saw this verse back in those days. But um, yeah, sorry about my voice. Oh my God. <laughs> I feel like my voice is going but um so yeah that's what that says so verse 11 I'm gonna write here um don't engage in darkness or sinful acts with people children of light should not do so but then it says um but instead expose them so again there's there's back to this whole exposing sin so instead of engaging with them like i did back in my time um what i should have did was um expose the sin while loving on them instead of engaging so what i could have done back in my college days when everyone wanted to go smoke weed i could have said hey you guys um you know maybe we shouldn't do that maybe we should go do you know go watch a movie or maybe we should go to the gym or maybe we should go um you know downtown to the mall and shop find a some way to um not take part in that activity and also find a way to weave scripture into that but unfortunately i wasn't like that back in the day i didn't think about scripture back in the day i'm being honest um so you know we do not need to do this uh Okay, so going back to what I said, but instead expose them. So instead of engaging with them in this act of sin or darkness, we need to expose the sin while loving the person. So again, exposing them not to humiliate them, but for them to see the sin that they're taking part in and to um, still love them in the midst of that. But we also do not need to do this for the purpose of merely talking about them, but for the purpose of educating ourselves enough to avoid them and them being... um, the sin so when we're helping to expose sin we're not supposed to be going to 
your best friend talking about so-and-so did this and they wasn't supposed to do this no you're not supposed to expose that sin to other people you're supposed to expose that sin to the actual person so you're supposed to be educating that person edifying that person so that they can see what the you know the sin that they're in and so that they can learn or begin to learn to how begin to learn to how <laughs> begin to learn how to avoid partaking in those sins and i know even though i wasn't the best back in my college days there were definitely some times when i found myself ministering to women or the girls on campus um various different girls on campus and helping them through my personal experience and um you know i'm like again i may not have been the most perfect i may have still been indulging in things that i should not have indulged in but i was also with envy indulging in those sins unfortunately and sadly but um i was still able to minister to people to help them get out of it and though that sounds completely weird and backwards it happened so um instead of engaging expose the sin while loving and my handwriting is chicken scratch pay me no mind today you guys but i don't feel good and i want to make this video <laughs> so while loving pretty much okay so moving on to verse 14 it says awake o sleeper so what i like about this is that it says um awake o sleeper is that christians can be asleep and not realize it and that is something that is very dangerous. Um, Christians can very much be asleep and not realize it. Just like a, a Christian can be dead spiritually and not understand that, you know? So, um, awake, O oh sleeper. And then it says, arise from the dead. So, Christians can be asleep and not realize it. Arise from the dead. Um, arise meaning that you're no longer spiritually dead, so now you can take your post. Um, when you're asleep, you're almost kind of like in a spiritual deficit, if you will. And you really can't take your post. You really can't do the things that you're supposed to do. You can't stand strong against the, the enemy's wiles. You can't stand strong against the schemes that he has. But when you're awake, you're now no longer spiritually dead. Now you have enough strength and power to take your post. So, um... No longer spiritually dead. I swear my handwriting is crazy. Take your post. I hope this is making sense, guys. Okay, so let's get some color up in here. Yeah, I definitely like how this looks when you're using black pen instead of blue. Definitely do, but you know. Bear with me, guys. I'm just adding all of my colors in. I'll probably edit this part out.
Okay. Moving on to the next paragraph. It says, verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as by, un I'm sorry. Verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand that the will of the Lord is, sorry, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to the God, sorry, to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So I really only have one word, and that is going to be in verse 21, and that word is submitting. And submitting, the Greek word is here, but um, the meaning is to subject oneself, to obey, to yield to one's admonition or advice. So it's basically giving completely of yourself, totally, and all that great stuff. Right? Okay. So, oopsie. Sorry for hitting the camera. Bear with me. I'm getting used to the recording again. <laughs> but um, submitting, I just wanted to do that. Okay, so now breaking down verse 15, it says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. So live as though you are spiritually abundant, not lacking anything. Be cautious as to who and what you are around. It can infect you, causing you not to be effective. And again, this goes back to me talking about in verse 11, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but expose them. Um, for me, I was around people hoping to be a light at some point in time but being around the darkness being around the sin that was um so much prevalent around me instead of me being effective and helping to minister to people i ended up being infected with the sin in the darkness around me and became comfortable in that sin i became comfortable especially when it came to sexual sin i was very comfortable with sex sex was nothing to me honestly and um that's not to say i was out here you know just spreading my legs open for anybody but when i was with someone in a relationship um be it six months a year two years um i was constantly having sex with that person because sex was just a normal thing for me and um i wasn't able to be as effective as i wanted to be um, and it started to really have uh, an effect on my life, like spiritually, physically, mentally, and emotionally. And um, not truly understanding that sex was an emotional and spiritual thing. Um, I only looked at it as a physical thing. And because I only saw it as physical, it started to cause me to be infected um, terribly. So, look carefully when you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Um, live as though is hopefully you guys can see this so live as though spiritually abundant. And not lacking. Be cautious because you can be infected, causing you. To be ineffective. Okay. Moving on to 16. It says making the best use of time because the days are evil. That's what verse 16 says. Okay. So basically capitalize on every appropriate opportunity. Don't let time pass you by because the enemy doesn't miss a, miss a second and neither should we. So making the use, the best use of time because the days are evil. 
um, I'm going to write on here. Verse 16. wrote that wrong capitalize on every appropriate opportunity do not let time pass Enemy doesn't miss a second. Um, give me one second. Let's see. Yeah, so um, Colossians 4 and 5 says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Um, and then... If I'm not mistaken, Ecclesiastes 11 and 2. Yeah, so just Colossians 4 and 5, okay? That's the cross-reference for that verse. Um, Colossians 4 and 5, which again, it reads, Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. All right, so moving on to 17, it says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand the will, what the will of the Lord is. So you can only understand by getting wisdom, and you can only get wisdom through prayer and studying his words. And you can read that in First Thessalonians 4 and 3, and I'll slow down and repeat that again, because I know I said that pretty fast. <laughs> so First Thessalonians 4 and 3. So um, again, for verse 17, it says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And for that, um, basically, you can only understand the will of the Lord by getting wisdom. And you can only get wisdom through prayer and studying his word. And 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Um, and, you know, that is just one of his... The will of God. Um, obviously, you can learn more through reading his word, but I, that is just one cross reference that I have for you. So going to verse 21, it says submitting to one another out of reverence right here. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So mutual submission to one another reveals that the spirit is within you. And that you reverence God. Submit keeping in mind authority properly done and how God designed us to be. And so when it talks about um, us submitting to each other, it's basically saying that if you get pulled over by a police officer, don't get out of pocket with that police officer. That police officer has authority. Keep in mind they have authority. Now, obviously, some people take their authority to the max. But as a child of God, you need to understand that they have authority given to them. And we know that all authority comes from God. So if this person has authority, there is a reason why they have authority. And we need to submit to them within that authority properly. There is no need for people to um, be irrational with officers and i'm using officers as an example because it can be you know it's, it's one of those things where the officer can stop you for something really really tiny and people especially people of color tend to blow up and i get it and i understand that a lot of the time officers take their power and um you know they run to the hills with it unfortunately but as children of christ as children of god we need to understand that they have power. We need to submit to them as if we are submitting to Christ, reverencing God through submitting to them. Um, the same thing with the children. We as children, we all have parents. Hopefully everyone has parents. <laughs> but um, we all have parents. We need to submit to that authority because submitting to them reveals that we have the Spirit in us because the Spirit then um, reveals that we reverence God. Hopefully that made sense. I think I just confused myself with what I just said. But... Um, yeah <laughs> I am going to write 
mutual submission and that's also the keyword is mutual because it says submitting to one another so therefore a parent should be submitting to their child and a child to the parent a police officer should be should be submitting to a civilian and a civilian to the officer a doctor should be submitting to their patient as well as a patient submitting to the doctor it should be done mutually out of reverence for christ um so it's a mutual submission unfortunately submission most of the times is not mutual unfortunately but submission mutual submission to one another reveals that the spirit is within and that you reverence God so submitting to somebody is not about you it has nothing to do with you it more so has everything to do with God and then we go into the last two paragraphs which I'm just going to read those together because they're so tiny um, which is entitled wives and husbands so this is going to be verses 22 to 33 and I'm just going to read that as one large paragraph so let's dive into that before I do that, excuse me. We need color. We know that Shanae likes color. Yes, my full name is Shanae for those of you who don't know. Let's get some mints on the page. And... Let's use this blue. Okay. So, moving on to 22. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for herself. I'm sorry. And gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one has ev sorry, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Verse 31 Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So, again, this is more so talking about husband and wives, wives submitting to their husbands, and hus husbands loving their wives. Um, and in that love, husbands are submitting to their wives, if that makes sense. Um... This is always a touchy subject for people because people tend to look at it as kind of like something that's um, degrading in a sense. And I'm not going to lie, as a kid, when I heard that, I was like, huh, what? But I now understand scripture and understand what it means. So before we get into that, I'm going to dive into the word that I wanted to define. And that word, <clears throat> oops, excuse me, again, is nourishes. And nourishes, here's the Greek definition for that. And the meaning is to bring up to maturity. Okay. Um, let's get some color. And let's get my last one here. Okay, let's stick that over there. So, 
beginning with 22 it says wives submit to your own husbands as to the lord so submission is not obedience or subordination it's a tender-hearted response to christ it's a voluntary response to servant leadership motivation to submit to the husband is part of the wife's duty to christ because it expresses submission to christ himself and um i think that's not you know what a lot of women don't understand especially those who don't know christ they think submitting to their husbands is all about their husbands but it has nothing to do with your husband in actuality when you're submitting to your husband you're submitting to christ it is it is an expression of submission to christ because your husband should be seen as you know the head of the household um the wife is considered the church the husband is considered christ if you continue to read further down that's what it says um so you know it really has nothing to do with you it's not about you being obedient to your husband or a subordinate to your husband it's more so a response to christ it's you expressing submission to him um and it's a voluntary response to servant leadership um it has nothing to do with your husband being a man it has nothing to do with um you being weak it has nothing to do with any of that and unfortunately in our society many women think that submitting to their husbands means that they're weak um and that really i personally believe if you submit if you can submit to your husband you're a strong woman because we as women tend to believe that it makes us weak but submission takes a lot of strength it takes a lot of trust it takes a lot of um of love you know when you submit to someone you're you're trusting this person with everything that you are so i feel that when wives submit to their husband it shows their true strength rather than them being weak i truly believe it shows strength that's just me personally now many of you may agree and if you agree i apologize for your disagreement but i personally feel like it is um a profound thing so I'm going to write submission is not obedience or subordination. It's a Tender-hearted response to Christ a voluntary response to servant leadership It expresses submission to Christ. Then it says, um, For the husband is the head of the wife as... I'm sorry. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So, the Bible does not put males over females, but it does call... For husbands to accept responsible leadership in the same spirit of self-giving and devotion to Christ. Um, I'm sorry. The self-giving and devotion Christ has shown for his church. So, um, Husbands are to accept responsible leadership in the same spirit of self-giving devotion as Christ 
showed the church. Okay. So again, it has nothing to do with your wife. It has nothing to do with your pride. It's more so about Christ. So the wife is submitting to the husband as an expression of submission to Christ. And the husband is taking responsibility of leadership, um, which should be in the same spirit of self-giving devotion as Christ did unto the church. Okay? So moving on to verse 24, it says, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands so again a wife's submission to her husband is a model of the union between christ and the church the church submits to christ so the wife should submit to the husband because the wife is seen as the church and the husband is seen as christ okay i'm just going to write Wife's mission to husband. A model of church submitting to Christ. Then it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands are to have unconditional sacrificial love for their wives as Christ did for the church. Christ had an unconditional sacrificial love for the church. He died on the cross for the church. He gave his whole being for the church, okay? So therefore, the husband should be willing to do the same. He should be willing to, in a sense, die for his wife. He should be willing to love her unconditionally no matter what she does. Christ loved all no matter if they were a sinner a rapist a murderer a thief an adulterer he loved every single person he died for every single person so the husband should do the same and i and, and it's it's really terrible when you read this and actually understand it um with uh spiritual eyes and not just physical because when i read this physically i was just like okay whatever good that's great that's awesome but looking at it on a different level and especially because i'm looking to be married myself um you know this this is really showing you a lot um in relation to the things that christ did for us and for the church as a whole um, so, you know, if the husband cannot have unconditional sacrificial love for his wife, then it puts into question the purpose of them being married, you know, um, kind of to me. So, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's verse 24, 25, sorry. Husbands are to have unconditional. As Christ did for the church. Okay. And we are almost done. So, verse 26 says that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the word. I'm sorry, washing of the water with the word. So a husband needs to be able to cleanse and purify his wife with his words the way God and Christ can do. No harmful thing should come out of his mouth toward his wife. So um, let's underline that. He might sanctify her cleansing by the washing. Of, I swear I get that verse confused all the time. He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Um, 
So not only should your husband, in essence, be dousing you in the actual word of God, but his words themselves should be able to cleanse and pur purify you. Um, so... Then it says in verse um, 27 that she might be holy and without blemish. So this is not referring to an outer beauty, but more so an internal beauty. So the husband should help to make sure that his wife remains spiritually beautiful. Um, it has nothing to do with her outer beauty. So I'm going to put spiritual beauty. And that's one thing that I'm learning is that um, I want my husband, my future husband, to be able to minister to me with the word of God. I want him to be able to pull out a scripture and tell me what the scripture is about. I want him to be able to, um, what, what is the word that I'm looking for? Um, I just want him to be able, he doesn't have to like know, know the word of God. I mean, no, but I don't think anybody's going to truly, truly know the word of God. But I want him to at least be able to say, hey, honey, um, let's sit down. You're feeling sad. Let's look at this verse together. Let's study this verse together. You know, I'm learning that that's what I truly desire more and more because I truly love um, reading the word of God, studying the word of God. There's something about the word of God that really heals and helps my, helps me in so many ways. And I want to be able to share that with my husband and I want my husband to be able to lead me in that way. Um, so, you know, that's just me. And unfortunately, it took me forever to realize that that's something that I really desired in a husband. Um, because I was always concerned about other things, like worldly things. But spiritually, I want my future husband to be spiritually um, abundant, spiritually rich. And to have his own personal relationship with Christ. So, yeah. Um, Moving on to verse 28. So, it says... Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. So marriage is sacred. It reflects the beauty of Christ's love and relationship with the church. It also reflects the character of God. So therefore, the wife is part of him, him being the husband. Um, so that's that. And then it says, he who loves himself. I'm sorry. He who loves his wife loves himself. So therefore, loving his wife is beneficial to him and neglecting her hurts him. So. So again, for the first portion, we're almost done here, guys. Three more verses to go. So the first portion is marriage is sacred. And this is the part where it says husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Marriage is sacred. As it reflects the beauty of Christ's love. And relationship with the church. And then for the second portion, it says, he who loves himself loves, I'm sorry, he who loves his wife loves himself. So loving his wife is beneficial. And I always heard the term happy wife, happy home. Um, but looking at it on a spiritual level, that is so true. When you 
are loving your wife, you're spiritually allowing yourself to be at full capacity. Um, you're doing the work that Christ did for the church. So, so loving his wife is beneficial to him. Neglecting her hurts him. So, a lot of the times, there are some husbands out there who neglect their wives, and um, they think they do it to hurt the wife. But in all actuality, you're hurting yourself because now you're damaging that covenant that you made before God, um, and that's something that's sacred. So, once you break a sacred covenant, a sacred vow that you made, um, now not only is your wife suffering, but you personally will suffer in many different ways, be it emotionally, physically, mentally. Um, you know, there are certain ways and aspects that that can um take place and i've seen it personally with my dad um there were things that he did within the marriage of my mom and it has totally put him in a place that he cannot get out of unfortunately without god he can't get out of this this place that he is in life without the help of god and in order to do that i feel like he needs to right the wrongs that he made with my mother but um until he does that i honestly believe that he will continue to be stuck in the position that he is in and um the same goes with with women um if you know a woman neglects her husband it's not just hurting her husband is hurting herself because not only are you neglecting your husband, but therefore neglecting your husband is now neglecting Christ because your husband should be um, the way that you express your love and, and submission to Christ. So it goes both ways, but um, yeah. So then verse 29 says, for no one who hated his own flesh, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. So therefore, you take care of your own flesh, and if not, you suffer. Marriage is a unity bringing two to one, so therefore, you nourish her to nourish yourself, okay? So for no one ever hated himself but nourishes and cherishes it. And then it says, just as Christ does for the church. So... Marriage is a unity. Therefore, nourishing her is nourishing self. Because now you're no longer two people, you're one. And then when it says, just as Christ does the church, um, it's oneness in every sense. So you have oneness of life, of service, of feeling, of necessity, oneness of nature, possession, condition and destiny um and that's i think crucial for people to understand when they're getting married you're not getting married just so that two people can still be two people no two people become one so therefore when you become one you are now of the same mind the same body and whatnot S spiritually speaking not physically obviously but spiritually now you're of oneness of life um your life is to each other but also with it being to each other it is to god as one okay of service to one another as one of feeling as one another i mean as one as um of necessity to one another there is oneness um and nature and possession i mean obviously y'all's stuff becomes you know one if that makes sense everything just becomes one spiritually speaking okay so hopefully that makes sense and again, I'm going to state these are not theological notes. These are not these are not biblically, you know, studied in different biblical research papers. Like no, these are just things that I personally feel and strongly believe in. Things that were revealed to me in my studies. These are things that I found in study Bibles. These are things that I have um, found looking at online res um, resources and things like that. So keep that in mind. All of this that I'm saying is a mixture of. Bible study notes, personal notes, and other resources and biblical revelation from the Heavenly Father. So, you know, 
Okay, just wanted to state that because a lot of people get that confused sometimes. Um, so then 31, we're almost done. It says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, right? Why not just underline that? This is obviously from Genesis 2 and 24. So, Genesis 2 and 24, but two souls... become one spiritually okay give me one second to plug up the phone because it's joining okay we're almost done now last verse it says um love his wife as himself so love his wife as himself Right, and then it says, "Let the wife see that she respects her husband." Okay, so where it says, "Love his wife as himself," basically there is oneness to be seen. So oneness to be seen. Unity. And then let the wife see that she respects her husband. So recognize him as the head, like reverential fear in all that we give unto Christ. But he is not Christ, okay? You don't respect him as if he is Christ, but you recognize him, meaning um, you submit to him and you love him as though you do Christ. But you don't make him your idol, okay? So let's just put that here. Respect and love him as Christ, but do not idolize. And I feel like I need to say that because most women do idolize their husbands. But um, that's pretty much it. I mean, I do have to do a lot of uh, coloring now. But um, that is pretty much it for this study, you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, again, this was not supposed to be some super sound, biblically doctrinated type of, you know, study. Um, it is what it is. I don't ever want my studies to be seen as that because I am not a theologian whatsoever. I am interested in seminary school, though, but I am personally not a theologian. But I hope this was a helpful video. I am just now going to spend time color coordinating things because... We need color on paper. But that is it for Ephesians 5. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. We will catch up later on to do chapter 6. And then we will be preparing for our study on Jonah. So I'll see you guys in the next video. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, leave them down below in the comment section. And I'll definitely get to you guys on that. And I'll chat with you guys later. Bye. Mm -hmm.